Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, I think it's our fourth show now, and last time I promised we'll, we're going to look at the, the foundation of uh, planting a native prairie using uh, um, Messick, doing Messick Prairie. And I, I start with the foundation of it because you can keep gardening it into what you'd like it to become and the number of species you'd like to keep adding through the practice of gardening. So we had a just to change the subject, we just had a great six and seven inch snowfall on Saturday. So I'm so excited that winter's, winter's here. And, uh, and it's great for our plants, it's great for soil moisture, and it's just great because it's clean and it's nice out and people take a, a, work at a slower pace too. So I just thought I'd just throw that in because it, it is winter and I miss the snow a little bit. So I think what I'd like to talk about now is start with the two questions. Again, we're gonna be discussing designing a uh, Messick prairie using uh, local, local, local plants in the Midwest. And my first question is, um, when you design a planting, are you aware of the progression of the plant development that occurs between the young plants through time? So what I'm simply asking, when you, when you make your selection of all the plants you want to use or like to use, are you aware of how they're gonna grow into each other? how they're going to establish which plant might dominate the group, which plant may not, or how they're going to share the possibilities of who they're going to be together. Because that's a tremendous thing to have an awareness of, and it's an important thing because that's going to relate to the time you spend trying to manipulate the planting so one plant is over, isn't overwhelming the other. And that's back to knowledge of plants. And the second question, which is two questions I've put together, what will the outcome of your actions be if you are not somewhat aware of how the plants you have placed will grow into each other from youth to maturity? So if you're not aware of what these plants are gonna do when they go from children to adults, are you aware who is going to care for this planting? And do you know the gar their gardening capabilities? So if you're designing something using, not, using any plants, if you're designing something using any plants and you're not quite aware of the outcome of the actions of the plants you place and how they'll grow into each other, and you're not even aware of who's going to care, love, or nurture it, how does anything, how do you anticipate anything to be successful? And the only way your planting can be successful is if you keep redefining what success is for yourself. So if, if it's something you don't feel comfortable with, you're just gonna have to say, you know what, I think I will feel comfortable with this. I'm gonna redefine what I believe to be beautiful and I'm gonna keep redefining what success is. Because when the plants are growing into each other in an unknown way, cared for by people that don't really understand the relationships that you've created or the relationships that are taking place, it's like putting everything you like in a bowl and heating it for two hours in an oven at 400 degrees. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're gonna eat it. It just turns to be something you throw in the dumpster, even if it was Every ingredient of every meal you've ever had that you've enjoyed is in that bowl. So I always like to stress that, is how will everything we plant, no matter how smart we think we're doing it, and I include myself in this, will it have the opportunity to be cared for and loved? And who's going to do it? And how long will that care, love, and affection last? So those are my two and a half questions. So what, I, what I'd like to start with in the discussion is uh, practice. And when I, when I, earlier in earlier videos, and I don't know if you've gone back to, to see some of them, where I use grid paper like I'm using here, and I just keep practicing, putting down the plants, understanding how, questioning how they're going to relate to each other, and then redefine the question, how will it relate to each other after two years, three years, and five. And that doesn't mean you have to have the exact right answer. If you believe you have to have the exact right answer, you will never will. There's no exactness to anything we're doing. We're, we're creating something with living beings that actually move, grow, live, age, and decline. So because of their dynamics, but once we understand what the possibilities are for each individual plant who has its own individual set of characteristics, and we combine them together, you're moving into a, 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 a good, reasonable, successful period of planting and you're also putting something out that can be cared for without a lot of labor. So it's practice, practice, practice and that's by just sketch your thoughts on paper and keep 
keep understanding who each plant is, how they grow, and how they move through life from youth to maturity. And there's some wonderful book, I think that is very helpful with our native plants locally in this region. And it was a book, uh, let me get the name up, it's the Flora of the Chicago Region. And it's the fifth edition by Jerry Wilhelm. And this book, I've talked about it before, this book lists every plant in, I think it's 18 to 20 counties that surround the Chicago area, native and non-native, and it's every plant. Uh, woody plants, herbaceous plants, native and non-native, and it lists all their associates. So if you look up uh, Quercus macrocarpa, you can see what plants are associated with, mac with bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa, and what percentage of plants associate with them. So it's a, it's a very good book to begin a thought process to see what plants are living with, with that plant within a community. And Laura Reichra, she has listed every insect that relates to every plant that she's aware of, and she continues that research now. She's, she's very good, very good. So this is an excellent book to take, to, give, to just give you a start in looking at plant associates using native plants within the Chicago area, within the Midwest. And the region extends east to west more than it does north to south. So I, I would recommend getting that book, or look in your own region and find books that are similar, that list the native species of plants within your region and who they associate with. Um, okay, so I wanted to get that out. And the next picture you see I, I put up is an image of the first prairie I ever designed. I never began life wanting to design anything. I wanted to design a good life for myself. That was always a goal, to find happiness and joy in things I love to do. And I thought I found that, and I did find that as a grower from 1978. My first design was in 1996, and it was for a resort out here in Lake Geneva. And they were building a condo, and they came to me and they said, Roy, we'd like to do our gardens with all native plants. And I was very excited, because at the time, I had grown over 150 species of native prairie and some woodland and some sedges at that time, which was quite a few. I probably only sold 16 of the species, 17, because nobody was interested in, at that time in the late 90s, early, late 80s, early 90s, about uh, natives ornamentally used. So I thought, wow, this is a good challenge. What, 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 how can I pursue this? Because I wanted to do it. And they said, but there's one thing, Roy. I said, yeah, what, what is it, Ken? And he said, it has to look good, <laughs> okay? And that puzzled me all the way home in my truck. I'm thinking, what do they believe it looking good is? And I asked him, and I said, well, how do you perceive looking good? He said, well, it can't be messy. I went to my nature center down in Illinois with my wife, and, and outside the nature center <clears throat> was all native plants, but they were falling over the sidewalk. You had to kick them in the air to get into the nature center. It just looked unkept. It looked messy. I said, okay, that's doable, because I realized I had full control over the placement of the plants. So if you have full control over the placement of the plants, which you all do no matter whether you want to or not, because the plants aren't going to jump out of the truck and select where they want to live and what they want to live with. I don't, I, that hasn't happened to me yet. So if you have had a truckload of plants that have found their own way of living and their own placement, send some comments to me and let me know how that worked out for you, because I'd really like to find that out. So since I had full control over the placement of the plants, when I, and I've walked through so many prairies, because I, I fully enjoyed understanding their relationships, mostly remnant prairies. I didn't, go, I didn't go, the only real prairie of value that was a restoration or recreation was the Schulenberg Prairie at the Morton Arboretum. So I, that, and that Ray did in an extremely thoughtful way, mimicking prairie remnants. So when I walked through that prairie, or I went to the Schulenberg Prairie, I could see scale and proportion of plants and relationships to each other. So my intent, as you can see in this picture, 1996, my first design, the simplest thing I could do was don't use any big grasses because they get too messy too quickly. And some people don't want to hear that. That, that seems hurtful to think that big blue stem is messy. Well, yeah, it's a messy plant because it gets too big and falls on top of everything. Sorgastrum newtons gets too big and falls on top of everything. 
But that doesn't mean you can't add them later, which we did. But we started with Spirobolus heterolepis and Schizacrium scoparium, little prairie drop seed and little blue stem. And that kept the scale shorter. And with that short scale, I could mix in the flowering plants that would poke up above the grasses. And the grasses became, like in most prairies I've seen, the remnants, the grasses were the support system. And I want you to see the next slide. This next slide is very important. This is a, a boulevard planting in Rockford that I was part of about uh, 15 years ago. <clears throat> and the city brought in the soil. They brought in high rich organic soil from some farmer. They bought it from some farmer and they filled the boulevards and the planting wasn't going to go in for probably uh, about a month, but they wanted to get the boulevard. So I went out there to take a look at it. Take a look at that image. Do you see how thick the agricultural weeds are? You can't see the soil. The, it's covered in agricultural weeds, which was a good thing because the agricultural weeds germinated. We'd, we have to kill them. They had to be killed and, and we had to plant in that. But one thing it did, it let me see the competition, the nature of the competition for these young plants we're putting in. And by seeing the nature of the competition, you could see you better be out there with your Dutch push pull hole every two weeks or every plant we put in will be shaded out and killed because these agricultural weeds grew like gangbusters. They grow very quickly. They'll get taller than the young plants in the four and a half inch pots and completely shade everything out. But if you're out there hoeing every two weeks, when the plants are germinating, you're out there wearing out the seed bank. So as they keep germinating, because they're gonna keep germinating because the plants need the water to survive to, until they root in. So you have to keep watering every four days, eight days, 10 days. And as the plants root in, you cut down on the watering, but the, seed, the, the seeds are germinating because of the constant moisture being applied by the water and you keep the plants alive. But with good hoeing and being consistent, you can win and you can win easily. And then when the plants mature in three, two to three years, they will shade out the soil and inhibit those weed seeds from germinating. So it's not an undoable thing. But when, when you first initially see that, you see that you get an idea of the competition you have in our area with our heavy clay soils. We have a tremendous seed bank in our heavy clay soils that are very competitive to anything we do. So I just wanted to point that up, point that out because some considerations you do now, we do a soil test. And I don't mean a soil test for NPK, we do soil tests for seed, seed germination. We'll take the soil test for seed just to see who the competition is and see the percentage of seeds that germinate. So there's a number of ways, and also use lean soil. Don't get soil that's high in organic matter. You know, you're, you're better off with kind of poor or lower organic matter content soil if you can find it. And sometimes you might not even need to bring soil in. You might just use the gravelly soil that might just be underneath the, the topsoil that gets scraped off in some certain developments, depending what's below the topsoil. So it's an assessment of each site you go to. You can't treat everything the same way. You have to assess the site, understand the conditions, and come away with goals and objectives for how you're going to plan it and how it will be cared for. So this, the following picture, you'll see once it comes up here. Okay, in this picture, this was a garden I put in around a, uh, a village, a city hall in Illinois. They wanted to, sh to show people opportunities for different plantings within the city. So we did a meadow garden, a highly composed meadow garden using native and non-native plants. It was, it was a combination of perennials and, and good, good solid perennials with natives. And this image shows, as one question with it, what way of being is missing here when you look at this image? And what's missing is something most landscapers can't identify diverse perennial and native plants. They don't know what to make of it. This planting is filled with Queen Anne's lace. And the people that were caring for it had no idea. They thought the Queen Anne's lace was just part of what I put in. So because they have no idea how to identify and understand the relationships, they didn't know what to do. And their only choice was don't take anything out except for the weeds they knew. And they knew Queen Anne's lace was something they don't allow to develop in other gardens. But because of this garden, they didn't know if it belonged there or not. And I can't really blame them, it's not their fault. That was my fault. 
what I should have done was meet with the landscapers who were going to take care of it and explain to them what I put in, the goals and objectives of the planting, and visit them when they're weeding it to, to point out the, the, the plants that should not be there. That was my fault for not following through on the process. You can't just create something and hand it off and say, see you later, hope it all works out for you. That's not a way, that's not a good, that's not best practices. You have to get involved through the whole process. You have to understand who's caring for it, what their capabilities are, and then you have to relate to them what your goals and objectives were for the planting and help them understand who these plants are and the relationships you've created. You have to do that. It's not, well, I don't feel like it. You have to feel like it. You have to be part of the whole system of living. It's like having children and saying, well, my, my daughter's 14 years old. Now, you know what? Good luck to you. I've taken care of you 14 years. I hope it all works out for you. <laughs> you're, gonna see, you're gonna be the parent of that daughter for the rest of her life. You will never not be her parent. Everything you put in the ground and the earth and place yourself, where you, even if you're scattering seeds, becomes something you're, of, a, of a responsibility that you have to share with the people that are going to care, love, or nurture it. So you have to be aware of how to carry what you're doing into a solid future. And we all do that with our own lives. We're all trying to carry our lives into a solid future to be healthy, happy, and constructive in what we do. So if you're dealing with plant design, it's not just being proud of the design you created, it's be proud and be happy that you can share that with others and that the others can realize the potential of its future. That's what, that's, that's what we do. We don't just do it, wave goodbye, get the check and go to dog and suds and celebrate. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not the whole idea of this. So let's look at our next. And the next slide you see is, is what happens in, this is a seeded prairie. And you can see with, with poor concepts of seeding, this, this prairie had, didn't have enough grass, a higher percentage of grasses in this seeded prairie. So the Echinacea purpurea came up, it was on a woodland edge. But look what moved in, it was Solidago canadensis. And it's not Solidago canadensis' fault, it's just doing what it can do. It's an opportunistic native plant that moved in and took over the uh, other plants that were with the Echinacea, shaded them out, overtook them. It has a very aggressive rhizominous nature. And because there's not enough grass in there to support a fire, there's not enough fuel, this can't be burned. And if it's not burned, the canadensis wins. So, and it's, it's, it's unattractive. And people say, well, it's still good for bees. And yes, it is. It's still good for certain bees, certain butterflies. But just think how much better it could be with more diversity. Sure, it's, it's, it's good enough for bees, but you know what? You know who is not attracted to it? Human beings. So what happens if human beings aren't the first thing this garden attracts? They rip it out. You have to attract human beings before you can hope to attract all the other creatures, the birds, the butterflies, and the bees. Because if human beings don't like it, I'm sorry to tell you, they're going to rip it out. And why not make it more attractive also to the bees, the birds, and all the other little creatures? I'm not an entomologist. I'm not an orth orth I'm, I'm a dirt gardener. I want to keep my life a simple life. I love gardening based on how I can put plants together so they socialize well and become gardens that I can enjoy aesthetically. And by enjoying them aesthetically, I can also minimize labor and turn what people call labor into the joy of gardening. And that's what I do, and all, and all these other things show up, the birds, butterflies, beads, they're everywhere in the gardens I put in, but I don't know who they are, I don't know how they live, I don't know their lifestyle. And that's okay, because I'm happy knowing what I do know, and happy knowing how, by contributing diversity, I'm, I, I can appreciate the direction the gardens go. And that's all we can do, find our niche and keep building on it. But when I look at this, I, I see how much better it could have been by having best practices used, encouraging more grasses to grow, managing with fire, and not having all the goldenrod take over. So I just wanted to have that discussion with you. And on this, this particular picture, it's a few more thoughts and it's about observation and change. 
how do you watch how things change? How are you observant to change? Managing the dynamics of the planting and mindful of the planting's goals. So when you see change, are you managing the dynamics of the plantings and are you mindful of the planting's goals or are you flexible enough to create new goals as the dynamics change too? That's a possibility. So it's not just one or the other, it could, it could be both. And awareness and attentive to the planting's uh, genuine changes. And what do I mean by genuine changes? Well, genuine changes could be not the possibility of something being overseeded because you put an aggressive plant in. If you have an aggressive plant that has the capabilities of overseeding, you might wait three to five years before you put that in, and the other plants are more mature and can handle the overseeding. So by genuine change would be as the plants that are more modest reseeders or, or reseed not aggressively, they genuinely will, t will relate to each other and grow into each other, sharing light and becoming healthy all at one time. And then when they become healthy all at one time, you can start enhancing the garden, adding more diversity to the planting. And I always call that gardening. That's what gardening is. It's a joy of enhancing and adding value to everything we do. And again, that's a, that's a, a lifestyle we have too. Don't you want to keep enjoying and advancing your life? I heard someone on the radio, someone asked this guy, that goes, what? So if you could go back, when was the best time of your life? And the guy's thinking, he said, yesterday. He said, you think if, if, he said, if 30 years ago was the best time of my life, what the hell was I doing for the last 30 years that made it worse? Yesterday was the best time of my life. And that's all the answers we should have. It should be, oh, I really had the best time of my life in high school. If you had the best time of your life in high school, what have you, you been doing the last 40 years <laughs> if that was the most fun you had. And that's how these plantings we are do should be. They should always be moving into a better direction. Always. And that's design and stewardship. Leads everything into a better direction, a healthier direction, a more diverse direction. And then goals and objectives. What, what do you want to accomplish with this planting? Everybody has different goals and objectives. Nobody has the same. And that's what's beautiful too. So this last slide before we get into the design, is kind of a conceptual thought. I'm looking at different concepts. This is a garden I did, a uh, uh, gravel garden actually. And I had prairie drop seed in here and it's uh, Echinacea pallida. But in, in with the two plants is Limonium latifolium. It's not native. But you know, the Echinacea pallida and the Sprabus, they're not going, what are we doing here? Who let this Limonium in? They, they share a good life together. It doesn't have to always be one or the other. I mentioned that in a few other shows. But the limonium, see that soft texture it adds in the center? That cloud-like, uh, that blue cloud-like uh, emotional moment? It really accents the Coreopsis, Palmeda, and the Sprabulus. It accents those three plants very nicely. And again, this isn't a strictly native garden, which I have told you we're going to be designing. But there's also other opportunities to allow to allow, I'm saying the word allow, to use other plants within the uh, native plants to enhance their beauty and not take away from their other capabilities of being good pollinators, good be for birds, butterflies, for uh, migratory birds. They all have that capability and, and they won't be handicapped because you put a few limonium in. I'm sure some scarlet tanager flying by is going, what are we gonna do here? Somebody threw in a limonium? I'm not going down to that garden. Come on, guys, let's go. We'll take off for the neighbor. They got more Menardas over there. That's not how this works. The, 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 the birds are just true to themselves. So people give too many human emotions to all these other creatures. They're just true to who they are. So I, I, I think the Limonium can have a nice life with these three plants. So we have to be open to that to allow as much flexibility and as much joy as far as planting that other people can appreciate too. So a thought, you ha a thought I have, a design thought mostly, and when I t talk about being aware, having awareness of the plants, this come to know moment that we keep adding value to plants and keep understanding them beyond bloom time, flower color, soil conditions and sunlight, is when and how long is transitional time from flowering to seed heads of one individual plant. So if you take uh, Heliopsis, Helianthoides, 
or you take uh, the Echinacea uh, purpurea that's in this picture, as it begins to bloom, how long before one flower, two flowers, three flowers are fading and the next group of flowers are starting to bloom? So it's not just length of bloom time, boy, this blooms from July till September. It's what percentage of flowers do you have and, and how do they start blending in with the seed heads? So you know that maybe in early September, you've got 10% flowers, 90% seed heads. And, and that might be seem like a trivial thing to know. But to me, it's very important to know because it's how do I transition the other plants within the community to take advantage of the, of the seed heads? What grasses can I put in there with a, a color change that would be an advantage to 10% flowers and 90% seed heads? So it's very important on each plant through time, not right away, but to know the percentages of flowers in bloom as the plant extend, has its bloom time from say mid-July to September. So I just wanted to point that one thing out, and that's mostly the one uh, unique char character I will point out in this program, because there's a lot of other things like that too, with foliage, with stems, with stem color. There's so many little changes that a plant goes through texturally through the year, and you can, if you know that, you can take advantage of that when you create your combinations. And that's simply called being the artist in the garden and having a, like a Monet moment of how you put your groupings together. And then this picture, you'll see I'm getting up. This picture is called the Poet's Garden. I, I really like, it's a Van Gogh painting. And I saw it for the first time at the Chicago uh, Art Institute when I was doing the gardens at the Art Institute. And I took this one close up image off uh, the Poet's Garden that uh, Van Gogh did. And this is gonna be, this. Impressionistic painting that is, is what I'm going to use for the example for the design I'm going to create with the, uh, the Messick Prairie design. So I wanted to show you this image and the ideas it created for me to create this garden. Because again, I use I like to use impressionistic painters because I just can't sometimes get started. I need I need something to create an impact so that I can understand the direction to go. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna have a sip of tea. Again, eraser, very important to have your eraser with you. And you can see how well worn it is because it's, it's good to make changes here because it's much easier than digging things out in the garden and moving them from place to place all the time. So the first thing, I've got about an island planting. It's about roughly 300 square feet. I got a, roughly about 300 square feet. So what I start with, I'm gonna make my plant list and I'm going to use Echinacea pallida. I'm going to use Coreopsis palmata. I'm going to use Echinacea purpurea. I'm going to Parthenium. And you heard that quite a bit on our earlier shows, Parthenium Integrifolium. And I'm going to start with Sporobolus heterolepis. That's my short grass. Gets around 36 inches to 40 inches tall in bloom. And I'm going to use Schizacrium scoparium. Okay, I'm going to give Pallida this mark, a circle for Coreopsis, a triangle for Echinacea, and a square for Parthenium. So the first thing I do, I, I look at the square footage, and I think, okay, I, the first thing I do is I put the patterns in. I put the flowering plants in first. So I'm going to start here with... Uh, Coreopsis pomata. And I'm going to scatter Coreopsis pomata through the planting. I'm using, I'm, I'm probably going to use four and a half inch pots. And again, 
I didn't mention this in my show earlier, but when I created the patterns in the earlier show, that was for average soil. And you say, well, Roy, what is average soil? Average soil is like most residential homes here in the Midwest. They've had uh, turf grass in their backyard for 15, 20 years. The turf grass roots have maybe gone down eight inches, so they've got good organic matter for about eight inches. And then the soil has seemed to define itself with a modest structure. It's not, the, it's not at all the same soil that was there prior to development, but it's, it's got a soil, soil good enough to support the, the young plants and the young plants fracturing that soil structure that's there and going deep into the earth. So it gets the plants off to a good start. So domestic prairie is basically similar conditions. You're not gonna have the same structured soil you would have had in a remnant prairie because it is a disturbed site. Everywhere in, in any city, village you're in, nothing's real. These are all disturbed soils redefining themselves. So, but domestic prairie for me has a large group of um, plants with a forgiving nature. So I'm using Coryops pomade. I have, I can grow almost anywhere in a, in, in a residential planting where the turf and conditions have been there for five, 10, 15 years. So I, I try to pick out plants that, again, have a forgiving nature and have durability. And that's what I'm starting with. And again, this is the foundation planting. This isn't a complete planting. And it, it, it will never be complete. And the only time a garden is done is when you run out of possibilities for it. And sometimes that's how life is too. If you run out of possibilities for yourself, you don't have much of a future left. So if you have possibilities for the garden, you keep enhancing and adding, and you're doing it because you want to, not because you have to. So I, again, I'm gonna put, let's go back to the palmetta here. Here, oops, eraser. Coryops is palmetta here. And so what I'm doing, I'm just drifting them through the planting. And I think I'm gonna put some on the edge here. So I'll have a mound of green in color. And I think I'm gonna put some, yeah, I think I'll go a little closer to the, right to the edge here too. No, I don't feel good about the edge. Right here. Okay. So I've got the Coryopsis palmata position. Next I'm gonna use uh, Echinacea pallida. And I'm gonna put them off to the side here. I've got them on about uh, 12, 15 inch centers. Let me space that one a little bit more. About 12 inch centers, 15 inch. One here. And I'm gonna mix with that, for contrast, Echinacea purpurea. Now this is a pattern I like and I saw this pattern at uh, about the third time I went to visit Pete, Pete Outoffs. It's beautiful. The contrasting petals of pallida and purpurea. So I, I, I use that a lot. It's just a beautiful pattern and Pete did a wonderful job selecting that. And I'm gonna put some here. Again with the purpurea surrounding it. I'm a little close, I want them to be at 12 inches, but that's okay. Because I've got the, op if I'm a little close here, I got the opportunity when I space them, in reality, to put them a little farther, or even a little closer together. We'll put some here. Now I'll put it up here. I'm gonna put a few more drifting through here. Yeah, I like that one there. And I'm gonna put some, I think over here. So again, I'm just, see, I'm just scattering them through. And that doesn't it mean you could scatter them this way and go up this way. You could go on linear patterns. But I'm just scattering them through. And Echinacea here. Purpurea. Purpurea here. and purpurea. So I'm beginning to get a feel for my patterns just with those three plants, the Coryapsis palmata, Echinacea pallida, and Echinacea purpurea. Now I'm gonna take uh, Parthenium. 
I already made a mistake. I have to put a triangle for Echinacea purpurea, not a square, the square is Parthenium. But see how you can catch that by sitting here and know what that cost me, that mistake? Embarrassment or something, I don't know, but it, not a penny, it didn't cost me a penny. I had to put a triangle in. And the other thing too I like is it's okay to screw up. You're not, there's no, I haven't seen the squad cars pull up yet to take me away from making a mistake. That's what you do. You, you, your greatest, my, some of the great best things I've ever done have come from mistakes I made because I, I learned from them. So to keep screwing up is okay for me. And I'm doing it here and I'm able to change it on paper. Okay. So now the square is the Parthenium and I'm putting one here and one here. I'm putting uh, one here, one here, here, and here. And you can see I'm not putting any Echinacea by the Coreopsis. I'm doing a Parthenium and Coreopsis together. So I'm kind of breaking up the repetition. I have repetition flowing through the center, but here I just feel like I want to do Parthenium and Coreopsis kind of on their own on this part. Okay, now I've listed Sporobolus and Schizacrum. I've given them no mark. I'm not putting those in yet. I'm gonna to go to my plant palette I have here on the computer and see, well, what else can I use in my plant palette? And I think I wanna do uh, Silphium terebinthinaceum, prairie dock. Okay, so I'll write that up here, Silphium Terebinthinaceum. That's called prairie dock. It's a cool, a cool plant. And it's also a cool plant to pronounce. And I never know if I'm pronouncing it right at all because I've never taken Latin. But it's a prairie dock, Silphium terebinthinaceum. And I'm going to give this a check for a symbol. Now Silphium, when, when you come to know it, it gets quite big. And it does reseed freely. So you'll have a lot of seedlings come up, but they're easy to identify because the leaf is large and rough and it, it stands right out. It's so easy to identify. So that way, when you see it receding, you, you can take the hole and just hoe it out. I can say, no, I like, I like where you've come up. So I'm gonna put one here, right behind the Parthenium. I'm gonna put one here, I think, uh, I'm gonna put one more, one more Coreopsis here. And I'm gonna put one here. And I'm gonna put one right here next to the Parthenium again. And you know what? For now, that's all I need. I just need three. They're very architectural, very structural. I'm, that doesn't mean I won't add more, but right now I'm okay with three. And I'm gonna go back to my list and I'm gonna look up, uh, oh, okay. Monarda Bradburyana. Okay, I'm gonna write that up here. Monarda Bradburyana. And one more I'm gonna take off my list. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna use uh, Liatris scariosa. Liatroscariosa, and that's not quite in our Messick prairies here, but it'll fit for me. And you can look it up and then you can make that decision, well, well I don't think I wanna use that because it's not, as, it's not as regional as I'd like to be. And that's a good decision to make when you look the plants up to see how, how regional you believe they are, how regional someone in your area who, who's uh, very comfortable with that has that explanation for you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take the Monarda Bradburyana and I'm gonna put, uh, I gotta give them a mark. I'm gonna give it a circle with a line through it. And I'm gonna give this one a cross. So the Liatris is a cross and the Monarda is a circle with a line through it. So I'm gonna put Monarda right here. And we'll put another group here. And 
and I'm have the Menard account, I want to have it sweeping from the edge, going this way, up here, and I'm going to have it, I think, follow through like this, up to the top this way. So I'm going to put a Menard here. Three of them, a group of three. And then put a group here. Here's my Coreopsis. So I want the Menarda, I want the Coreopsis to weep over the Menarda. I like that look. And I'm going to put a bigger group of Menarda in here so it'll be more of a group planting, not as mixed. So the Coreopsis will bloom. It blooms the same time as the Menarda, and that will fall over the Menarda a little bit but I have the Monarda as a group planting right here. And I'll probably put a few more Monarda right here. You know what, I think I'll put a couple right here too. This is with the Echinaceas. So I got right there. Okay, and the Liatris. With the liatris, which is a larger plant, a larger liatris, so it, larger, it has larger flowers and arches over more gently and later blooming, I think I'm going to run that kind of independently through here. So I'm going to keep that independent. I'll put two here, two here. Two here. And I think for now, I've got it going through here. I feel, for me, a balance, I think, is going to be right here. And that'll be in with the sylphium, with the coarse foliage. I've got the, so I've got a density here, but I got the bigger group, for me, emotionally supports the density, so it's not too mingled. And I've got the yellow, the coneflowers, and the parthenium, and the liatris. So it's a busy area right in here. Okay, now I, now I make a judgment. Okay, do I have enough patterns drifting through here? And I look at repetition. How's my repetition? I've got Echinacea, Echinacea, Parthenium, over here with Coreopsis, Echinacea, 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 Parthenium, with, and Parthenium down. I, I think I'm, I feel pretty good. I, I feel pretty good about my repetition. And I've got larger gaps in here with grasses. So. What can I fill in with the sprabless and the little blue stem? Hmm. So I look at my list, and I have uh, Allium cernuum. Then I have to think, when I think about Allium cernuum, it recedes very aggressively. So if I put Allium cernuum, do I, what am I, how am I going to place Allium cernuum so it doesn't dominate the planting? So what, what I'm thinking is I'm going to leave it out. Because I like Allium cernuum, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to put it in later. So what I'm going to look at, I've got, I've got most of my areas covered. So I'm going to add some spring uh, natives. And I'm going to put in prairie smoke, GM triflorum. So let me write that down. That blooms in May. And I'm going to put in... Uh, Where's the other? Origeron. Origeron Puchellus. Okay. Now these are two plants. They bloom in May. Early, early, the early blooming uh, prairie. And they make a nice ground cover in between the plants. And they're able to collect light early and they stay healthy as the plants grow taller around them and limit uh, the limit light collection as the prairie ages. So I'm, I'm starting with them in here. I have to give them a symbol. I'm gonna give the geum, I think I'm just gonna put a G for geum and an E for origin, origin, origin. So I've got G, G, G on the edges. And I'm making groups of three because I want them to bind together t tightly. They, bo they both spread by rhizomes, bind together tightly, so they'll have enough area to collect light as a bigger group when the prairie drop seed that I'm going to put around them fills, fills in with foliage. And I'm going to put a few 
a little deeper in the garden, maybe here. And I'm going to put four in here. And I'm going to put four in here. I think I'll put four there. And over here, I'm going to use the Origeron. E, E, E. And I might put right here, E, 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 and E. Okay, so I've got Origerons here. Um, I feel good. I don't want to put them by the Monarda. The Monarda come up too early. They come up very early in flower in June. So, but that doesn't mean I won't do it later when, I, when I'm interpreting the garden two to three years later. I said, this is a foundation planting. So and there might be some things I have to move after the first year when I look at it in reality or the second year. But this is the foundation I'm starting with. So all these gaps that I have here, you see all the gaps, all these open spaces? I'm going to fill these in with Sporobolis, prairie drop seed. And what I've learned lately is to use smaller pots. If these are four and a half inch pots, and we, we did this and it was quite successful on a project uh, in um, Detroit, a peat out off planting. Austin Eyscheid and I laid it out. Pete, unfortunately, wasn't able to come because of COVID. And we used two and a half inch containers sporobolus, which made it economical. But that way, the patterns could fill in and get larger and more mature. And then the sporobolus filled in behind them, and they filled in the gaps and holes with the grass. If you use a big uh, one gallon sporobolus or schizacrum, they would get bigger quickly and their foliage, especially sprobless, would extend out maybe 30 to 36 inches and shade out the maturing plants. So I, I, I like the way that project worked out and that's that self-discovery again. That's the part where if you think you know everything, you're done for. It's just, there's no future for you if you think you know everything. And I'm, far, I'm, still in the, I'm still in the world of trying to figure out what I don't know I don't know. And I think that was one thing I didn't know I didn't know. I didn't know if by using younger plants that would give time for the more, the flowering plants to mature more and the sprouts didn't overwhelm them. So now that I've known that, I'm taking an action on it and I'm doing more of that. And I find by doing more of that, I'm creating a good economical base for my clients too. You don't have to buy six inch pots or one gallon containers to make things successful. You can buy the smaller plugs be more patient, let the mature plants fill in and let the grasses fill in later. And in two to three years, you've got an established planting, but you still can garden in more diversity. And that's the fun part, is observing, like I mentioned at one side, observing and making changes through observation. So I'm just gonna put S here for Sporobolus, all through here. S, you see, that's gonna be my two and a half inch Sporobolus. Okay. And I still have schizacrium. So I'm gonna put in little blue stem more as a vertical accent plant with the copper fall color, beautiful copper fall color, the vertical growth habit. And sometimes little blue stem can be blue, bluish green. The nice thing is by not using uh, selection, which means you can't, you could use uh, jazz or a selection of little blue stem that has a rich blue color. But when you use the species from seed, one, you'll, get, you'll get the rich blue, soft blue, green, you'll get shades of blue. And sometimes the shades of blue are more, uh, more valuable because it's not just one look all through the planting. So then I'll, I'm gonna take the uh, schizacrium, I'm gonna give that a symbol. What haven't I used? I'll use a square with a line through it. And I'm going to put one, two, three, four here. And again, my S is Sporobus. I'll keep filling in all the gaps with Sporobus. And that's with the Parthenium. And that ties the Parthenium together. And the Coreopsis with the Echinacea, with the Echinaceas, the, the Pallida and Purpurea. And then I'm going to do the same thing here. 
put in four. And the vertical is going to be with the uh, liatris. So the liatris will lean over onto the vertical growth of the schizacrum. So you have a support system there. In fact, knowing that, I'm going to put one more in right here, too. Let me get a little farther away. So I will have liatris, and that's the support system for the liatris is the schizacrum. And here I have more liatris. So I'll put a little blue stem here. And I'll put one right here, maybe two. So I got four there, four here. I've got liatris here. So I'm going to put a little blue stem in between the liatris. Right here. There it is. So I've got this pretty well filled in with the little blue stem. I've got the sporobolus along here with the soft arching foliage. I've got the Menarda bradburiana upright with the copper, copper green foliage of the Menarda bradburiana. It's starting to take shape. And I can read all this right off the grid paper. So that's the beauty of it. I can look at my patterns. I can follow what I see here, vertical, vertical. Time of bloom, the latris is uh, August. Menard is going to be June. I got good dense foliage here. Then I got sprobolus right here in front. The Menard will peek over the sprobolus. It's looking good. I feel I feel good about it. So now let's let's say this is um, four years later. Let's say okay, we're four years into the planting. I haven't aged a bit, have I? <laughs> it's fun to say that now. So anyway. Four years later, what can we add to this now that we have mature plants? We don't have young children anymore. We have, mature, we have young, old mature, older mature plants that have, that have claimed their real estate. They're not going to get pushed around by reseeding bullies. Okay? They have ground. And they're not going to get shaded out by reseeding bullies either. And it's not that native plants want to be bullies. They become aggressive simply because they're put in a situation that they can't help themselves. Big blue stem does not want to be a bully, but when we use it and put it in initially, it can't help but reseed and it can't help but get taller and shade out and reduce the light energy going to all the other plants. Indian grass doesn't want to be a bully, so Gastrum newtons, but when you use it right away, it can't help but reseed everywhere. And when it reseeds everywhere, how are you going to find the time to pull out all those seedlings that have grown into crowns of all those plants? You're not going to have that kind of time. So the only thing you can do is, like I mentioned earlier, is just befriend it. Because that's what you're going to have for Time Eternal, is that garden that you created. So whatever situation is happening that you're not comfortable with, you can't blame the plants. You can only, I, everything goes, again, I pointed out, it's all, it's, the thumb goes this way. Anything that's not successful is my fault. I, I can't blame the gardener, I can't blame the contractor, I can't, if I'm there when the plants are going, and I should see that the contractor's planting them too deep. I have to walk around and be observant. And actually, it's fun. It's fun to, 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 to recognize something that we have to change and fix and, and deal with. So let's say we got four years later. You know what? I like the way the echinacea, I like the way the echinacea are filling in. I'm looking at the sporobolus. The sporobolus is more mature. It's getting denser. So, you know, I want to introduce the Allium cernuum. So I go over here where I have sporobolus, and I might take out, I might dig out two sporobolus clumps, which would, at that time, in four years, I might have an area then of about two square feet open. And what I'll do is probably plant three to four quarts of Allium cernuum, so I fill that space and keep it in scale with the plants as, as they are. Or I might put five plugs in to fill that two square feet and put them tight because I, I don't want I can't let the two and a half inch plant mingle in with all the adults the adults will overwhelm it so I have to make the area fill two two sprobolus maybe three and fill it in with four or five quarts or five two and a half inch containers of allium cernuum so I might put a grouping here I'll put a like an explosion <laughs> I might put a group here with the geums, an explosion. 
And you have to remember, the groups I put in are going to keep seeding. They'll find any little opportunity they find where something is not doing well, you'll see a little allium come up. And that might be okay. That might be the good dynamics into the future that fills the gaps and holes that were created that you don't have to deal with. And if you do see them, you can actually hoe them out too if you don't want them coming up in that certain area. So I might put some here with the geome again and with the uh, origeron, I might put one here. Another one here with the origeron at the base of the uh, sylphium. And I might put one back here with the geom. And you know what? I might put one, I might take out an echinacea, I don't know. Maybe an echinacea is our seeding or, or they got too crowded along the edge. So say the edge is too crowded, I might take out one of the echinaceas and put, a, put an allium right here. But that's something I really don't know until four years later when I assess the garden and look at what, what can I enhance, what can I add, and how is everything moving forward. And I can do the same thing with uh, Oryngium yuccifolium, Rattlesnake Master, because that seeds freely too, the first, the second year from seed. That'll come up through a lot of plants and get in the crown of plants. So I might take the Oryngium yuccifolium, and I really like the way it looks with the Echinaceas and the Parthenium especially. So I might put uh, two here. I'll make a dash like this. I might put two here, or three. Up and I would take out a Sprobilus, probably two, put two of the Eryngium in. I'll look for another Parthenium and team it up with that. I might put two here and take out a few Sprobilus. And where do I have Parthenium again? I don't have it here. I have it right here. But that's, I, that's too close to the edge. I want to get in deeper. Here's some. I have two over here. I'll put one here and one here and take out a few more Sprobilus. Okay, maybe I'm, that's my enhancement for that year. And that can go on. You can look, uh, say, two years later, and you can introduce a solid ego now because your planting is actually dense and the ground is covered by early to mid-June. Probably mid-June the ground is covered. There's no soil exposed. But you might be able to add solid ego speciosa the fourth or fifth year because now your plants are so mature because solid ego speciosa will seed the first year from seed. That'll seed everywhere. But with this style of planting four years later, when you've got a good foundation, the solid ego speciosa has no, nowhere to go. It may come up in some spots, but it's not gonna overwhelm the garden because now your plants are too mature. So the fourth or fifth year, I might say, you know what? I might, uh, I need the grasses. You know what, I might take out Echinacea purpurea over here and over here, keep the palata and put in I'll put a big S for solid ego species. I'll put two solid egos here. And with that, I think I'm gonna take out, uh, what do I have for? I might take out one of the Monardas or one of the little blue stems. Yeah, I'll take out a little blue stem. And right here with the, with the solid ego, I'm gonna put an Aster Laevis, have powder blue. So I take out the little blue stem and I put in a big A for Aster Levis. And that's just something I'm doing 15 minutes after I did the original drawing. So you might make a different decision four years later of where these plants will fit in, but that's all the thing, opportunities you have to do, isn't it? And if this isn't too much fun, you know, then you should be a plumber. This is like the best, this is good. And you're, and you're constantly creating good habitat for not just yourself, or, emotion, or good for emotionally for people, you're putting uh, solid dated plants in a position to look, to look good with good composition. It doesn't look messy, it doesn't turn people off. Like that group that wanted me to put it in so it looked good. They didn't want to kick over the big plant that was flopping over the sidewalk. They didn't want big grasses that were, uh, they, they, they believe somebody's hiding behind that would jump on their children. They just wanted low scale, something low profile, three to four feet to begin with. And that doesn't mean you can't work in the Indian grass in here either. You can't put in, you could put big blue stem in, you could put Indian grass in, but the idea is they can't outcompete the children because these aren't children anymore, these are adults. So it's just a matter of scale, a matter of time, and a matter of joy. 
So if you put all these together, you become the solid gardener and designer. And then also find the mistakes you made. I made, I made mistakes here and I can correct those by moving something or take, but I don't have to change the whole planting. So that's our story for today. I, I hope uh, that I've helped you in the thinking process moving forward. Because actually I have to thank all of you. I love doing these YouTubes because it puts me in a perspective to rethink everything I'm doing. I, I can look at this and I can, I can re, rethink how, is, how do I approach what I do in, in a solid way. So thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to share with you. I'll see you next time.